So they arranged for me to do a manhunt exercise. And the goal is to find where they live and break into their home. And so I flew out to a city in Romania that I won't name, but I showed up there with nothing other than just some tools. And it was like, all right, let's, let's find this guy. It starts with just taking that leap. Man, you have to work hard. You have to be incredibly smart. Choose something that even if it fails, even if it fails you are going to be proud of. It doesn't matter how badly you got beaten down. Be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. <laughs> I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. Alec is a hacker, but he's not just hacking computers. He also hacks a human body. From his early explorations into biohacking and biology, Alec became one of the founders of Biohack ATX Club and eventually took part in the mini circle gene therapy. With a journey marked by curiosity and experimentation, we discuss what brought Alec into the biohacking world and Tor Kuya, a sanctuary where science meets the soul. Okay. So Alec, where are we right now? Right now we're at the great, amazing 10th planet, Austin, out here in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is home to essentially the grappling capital of the world now. Uh, we have New Wave, which is kind of your elite uh, star level grapplers that everybody in the world knows. Same with B Team. B Team is also a premier school. Um, they are known as the, the, the second best school in the world, quite when literally. When did you get into it? When did I get into Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah. 2017. 2017, okay, so you've been doing it. Like, have you been doing it at this, like, this per, frequency? Yeah, yeah this here? has been my exclusive gym. Huge, mm -hmm. huge. And, like, when did you start experimenting with, like, different kind of, I guess, therapies and, like, biohacking oh. stuff? Maybe the first time ever, I was probably a year and a half, two years into Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. and I was kind of phased by the uh, some of the waves of injury that comes in uh, in grappling uh, there's there's some obstacles to get over so I first started realizing I was like man I'm not really I'm not feeling great um, and at the time I was really just overtraining. Yeah. Uh, but like were you getting like sprains and such or like oh, yeah. dislocating yeah, yeah. Or, okay, like right. I had by that point I had already had my a couple of my ribs dislocated mm -hmm. had dislocate your ribs oh yeah how? It's like, very where, common. Where does, where do I they... mean, if, if someone's just putting a lot of pressure on your torso uh. and there's a lot of torsion while that pressure is there, I mean, the rib just dislocates uh. out of the, uh, Jeez. the um, what do they call that? Um, rib cage? <laughs> yeah, the rib cage, but there's just the intercostal muscles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so either, either in the front of the ribs or in the chops, yeah. they can, uh, that happens. But I was just experiencing a lot of pain, um, a lot of injury. It wasn't really healing right. Yeah. So I experimented with like a SARM. What's a SARM? A SARM is a selective androgen receptor modulator. So it's basically a more targeted androgen, um, which the, the goal of it is to grow skeletal muscle and kind of avoid things like your prostate or your heart. Um, you know, even though there's androgen receptors in there, the selectivity of the drug uh, focuses on skeletal muscle. So right. that's the claim of it. So you said it was well known this kind of thing would work? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's uh, quite a few people that uh, that have done SARMs in the past, and uh, there's a little bit of literature on on their effectiveness. And so was that like the moment you were like, oh shit, like I'm kind of like interested in this whole world of like biohacking and experimenting on myself. No, I was into uh, biohacking before that. Um, okay. So yeah. what was like the first thing that you were? You, the first you thing did, it yeah. was pre-athletics. Yeah. Uh, I was just uh, from a young age. I was always into like HIV. Uh, there yeah. was a big scare around it. So yeah. when I was like 15, I started to look into biology. And then by the time I got out of the house, uh, I was maybe 21, 22 when I met Mac. Um, and I had a, a buddy, Sean, as my roommate. And we started a club with Mac called Biohack ATX uh -huh. uh, and a Bitcoin club. So there was just nice. cool overlap in the biotech space. So you were getting interested in like, and initially it was like HIV and I uh, got kind of got you into biology and then you started this club with Mac. How did you start experimenting on yourself? Uh, the first time it was Mac had a uh, night vision eye drop. A night vision eye drop? Yes. <laughs> what yes. does that mean? 
basically the the goal of this little thing was to you put it in your eyes and it would uh it would help you see at night uh it would, you know dilate your pupils in a way wait, wait, you would drop it in your eyes and what would it do yeah you'd put it in your eyes and you'd wait a little bit and then you'd go out into the dark and like a wolverine and just try to see what you could see out there what uh, was in the drops uh i believe it was some type of not a it's a uh, it's a specific type of uh, solvent. It's like a it's like a organic solvent. Does it come D from like DMSO, deep sea fish or something? Or? Something, yeah, something like ocean. I think I can't remember. Yeah. But uh, DMSO uh, and some insulin-like growth factor or something. Um, so yeah, we did that. And then uh, that. Why that, do you feel like you had such a high risk tolerance? Um, I think I don't really have that high of a risk tolerance. Uh, it would think it was more um, just kind of a willingness to trust others. And, uh, you know, Mac and other folks that I'd met had uh, a lot of overlap in opinions that had been unconventional for the era and like the time. Right. But I knew to be like very grounded in what I would think is a sense of truth. And that guided me towards that trust. Yeah. Um, I do think I had some risk-taking behavior. I think it just might be like me being an idiot and just being <laughs> young, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so I could have gone horribly wrong, but thankfully it didn't. But it didn't. Yeah, and no. were you able to see in the dark a you bit know, better? It, it, was, it was like marginal. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was like anything crazy. It's not like what you would imagine it to be. Um, but it was this black liquid and it was really cool looking. And you did get a good, a good bit of um, like the threshold where it matters to have night vision, like if you can't see anything, yeah. you could see something. But it wasn't like what you might think where it's like, I just put these in and then now I can see like I'm you know, yeah. in light. It's not like that. So after that, like how did you plunge even further into it? Was that just like validating that, okay, you can experiment with these things. You can put it, these strange fish drops in your eyes and it's gonna make you see in the dark. Uh, and it kind of worked, and so it's like, okay, what else can I do to my body that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it was like the first thing that I could do myself, um, and I found a deep sense of novelty in being able to do things for myself um, and do things that hadn't been known about. Yeah. Uh, so around that time, there was the explosion of like CRISPR, where that started to become really well known. And Mac and Walter, they were, you know, doing CRISPR experiments in their uh, their lab, and showing us how to do them. And uh, you know, their lab, like what was their lab? Yeah, they had a little wet lab at this uh, place called Prophase Bio Studios, yeah. which was a 501c3. And that whole community of guys experimenting with different ways to either make a new therapy or extract capital capital in like an interesting way. Yeah. Uh, that was very big uh, inspiration to me. And that wet lab that they had was in the same space as this ATX hacker space, um, which was kind of more my alignment of, of like computers, computer right. hacking. So I had inspiration to like try to get a hold of my school's computer systems and uh, you know, beat tests and stuff like that. So that's yeah, we about were talking the other day about like you finding out how to reverse the scantron to make yeah. a key that gets you like a hundred percent. Yeah, I just noticed one day I was like, you know, they use the same scantrons that we do, and I was always going in during lunch hours, and I would literally like credit card Jimmy open the door to get the scantrons so I wouldn't have to take these tests. And after stealing enough of these scantrons, I just saw that there were these bubbles that they would fill in at the top of them. And that's when I learned, oh, there's a specific code. Uh. So I would sneak into that scantron machine room and I would like look at the specs on it. And I was like, oh, this is how you make a key. Huh. And whenever I would turn in my test, I would just fill in the right bubbles and it would just come out as a key. So getting a sense of that power over like systems yeah. from a young age very much motivated me. Yeah. And so then it's like, okay, you can do it with a Scantron machine. You can do it with maybe some computers. Yeah. How about your own body? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we kind of went through the, the fish drop eye stuff. We went through some of like the wet lab stuff. When do you even like step it up more? Um, well, that really kicked off with Mac and Walter when they started looking deeper into plasmids and they were telling me about the concept of plasmid engineering 
And I roughly understood the, the role of a plasmid. And I understood like the basics of like cell walls and membranes. So when they explained to me this idea of it being like a, like a book on the shelf that the, that the cell can like just trans transcribe from, I was like, huh? And I was still too afraid to do anything with like manipulating my genetics because Why of the time. Afraid? Well, because my understanding, my model of gene therapies was more of like what the average person might think when they talk about editing their genome. You kind of think about replication of, of that DNA throughout your body yeah. in a way that is uncontrolled uh, or like exponential or logarithmic where you can see it's like just this explosive curve and you don't you can't really control that. Yeah. So I didn't like that. Um, and it wasn't until later that I learned that the, the delivery here of the plasmid doesn't doesn't really allow it to to escape much in, in theory. So it's not and it, it has no mechanism for it to just continuously uh, replicate in like a viral fashion. So when I understood that that was not that's the case, basically like the key difference between the mini circle and the, the viral injection of like gene therapies. It's that the mini circle has less chance of just replicating in some of the bad ways that could like. Yeah, it's not gonna. It's not gonna. You. And it also doesn't like fully incorporate into chromosomal yeah. DNA there and then replicate. It's so. At uh, what point were you like, this is? This is something that I want to. To be honest, I waited like four or five years. I told them, I was, yeah, I was like, hey, look, if you guys are still alive and healthy in, in like four or five years time. Because Mac had already injected himself. He did, um, but it, was, it wasn't until I saw it with Walter that I even gave a damn. Because uh, before that, I was like, yeah, I mean, you guys have this idea. Maybe it'll work, yeah. but probably not. And then like three months later, I seen Walter come back from Appalachia and he was, I mean, and this is a guy that I kind of just look at as like a complete, complete like white paper nerd, yeah. you know, wizard, hilarious one, but like was just in the books, thin as a rail. Yeah. And when he came back and I saw him three months later and his back was straight, he had this like kind of barrel chest going on and he gave me this massive bear hug and the guy just looked taller. And at the time he was 23, so you know, I think like mostly grown yeah. and I was just amazed at that. I knew there was absolutely zero explanation because other than the therapy, because he was not the type to do just uncontrolled drugs. He wouldn't just take steroids or right. anything. So when I saw that, that's when I was like, okay, this works. And if y'all don't die in four or five years, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll try it out. And uh, four or five years later it rolled by. And they were both fine and both bigger, noticeably. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, okay, this seems like this could work. Um, and tried it out and it worked. What was the state of your body before you were thinking about injecting yourself with this gene therapy? Uh, I was a bit thinner. I was, I was quite a bit thinner. Um, and I'll, I'll give you guys some photos of kind of like what I looked like before yeah. then. Uh, and I had a big injury at the time that I was you know, really helpful for, for uh, something to help me out with. Yeah. Um, and what I was injury. Uh, I had all three of my ligaments and uh, torn here. Yeah. So like this one, this one, and this one right here, they're just completely ripped, like grade three tears. Yeah. And uh, that was pretty horrible. Uh, I couldn't really walk well. And I was also probably bordering on overtraining still. Um, so I wasn't really healing the right way. And at that time I was like kind of, a little bit more desperate to find something because uh, grappling is a big passion for me. Uh, and yeah, as soon as I did the therapy, within like, I mean, within a couple of weeks, I had, like I really felt something in my mind. I felt like cognitively different. Um, and by around like 90 days, it was Cognitively just, differently in what way? Um, I was probably a bit more aggressive, uh, mm. a, bit, a bit hungrier, uh, a bit more sexual too. Um, there was aggressive like, and like, uh, like, like, a, and a, like, like aggression, like get, like getting yeah. mad more. Not like necessarily getting mad. Um, like it wasn't in my day to day life that I was angry. It was more just like once I turned on the switch of like, Hey, yeah. you know, my, 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 my fire there was, was on. Yeah. And, uh, so I felt that, uh, a bit more than the, than the average days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how did it 
change like how you started grappling? How did it affect your uh, your ankle injury? Or... The, you know, the ankle injury, I don't think that like it really had a substantial effect on it other than the fact that I felt a bit more motivated and a bit more muscular to build up around the ankle. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that the ankle itself was uh, was improved by that particular therapy. Uh, there's a chance that it yeah. was because it is it is rather healed now. But I mean, I had I had an extended problem with that, and you can't yeah. just like get around that. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you really tear ligaments up, they're they're pretty fucked up. Yeah. So uh, the mode of that therapy, I don't know how much affected it, but um, uh, I felt way stronger, um, and I got a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, and how much weight did you put on? I put on around 15 pounds um, total. You know, probably a good. And here's the interesting part: is, and how much did you weigh before? Uh, well, how much did I weigh? I can't remember the exact numbers. I have to reflect on the, the DEXA scans. But uh, I remember the, the scans reflected I gained in like three months 6.2 pounds of dry muscle, mm. um, which is unheard of for me because I did not change literally anything. Yeah. Um, I was one of the people in the study that I decided like I, I wanted to know for myself whether or not the things that – and I was considering investing. I was like I want to know that this works in the worst case scenario where I basically, I'm not changing a damn thing. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't eat any more food. I didn't work out anymore. I didn't do any weightlifting. I just stuck with my grappling regimen. And I, to put on six pounds of dry muscle doing that is pretty much unheard of in yeah. three months, uh, unless you're lifting aggressively and eating a lot. So. And then I put on probably another seven pounds of fat, seven or eight pounds of fat. Um, and that, that whole dynamic was just so interesting to me how that happened. Um, so I would get comments where, because I, I didn't tell everybody. I, I told a couple people, my roommates, and that was it. Um, yeah. And it kind of kept it quiet until a couple months in. And I remember people coming up to me and people approached my girlfriend as well, asking like, hey, what's Alec on? You know, yeah. I know he's on something. Um, what's he doing? Uh, and eventually, it just came to be known that I was like, "Yeah, I was just GMO now." So, that's that's how it affected me. Um, wow. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. And so now, like, how many like how many months has it been since you've been injected? It's been about a year and a year and four months or so. And so, are the are the effects still as strong as? They're not as strong at the at the peak, yeah. but I will say that I am still carrying extra muscle. Like yeah. I, I can definitely tell that my mass is like the mass of my muscle is just much bigger. Mm. I, I, it's kind of stark when you look at you know the photos of me beforehand. Yeah. Um, or it's just like damn, like, because I, I was I'm already I was already a full grown man at that point yeah. where you know I'm like 26, 27. Uh, you're you're about done growing there. Yeah. Uh, 28, 29, you're about done growing. I'm 30, so I did the therapy at 29, and I'm still significantly bigger than then. So wow. it has to be working. So what are the reasons that like you shouldn't do it? Shouldn't do it. Um, you know, I think that there's probably a variety of reasons why you shouldn't mess with your genome. I yeah. think that uh, certain folks, maybe if you have a cancer inside of you and you have something that's kind of like stimulating growth, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's a big reason to really be cautious about anything that's, you know, growing your cells um, in any way. Uh, I think if you have potentially, um, you know, it, it depends um, on the organism. And I think certain people have more myostatin than others. And I think that can change a lot of the dynamics there. But uh, my only, like, study-based thing against maybe messing around with your full statin would would be related to ligaments um, and scleraxin to where I think I mean and I'm gonna butcher this but yeah. I think like the, the the fibroblasts inside of your your body they'll expand mm. um, and I think some of the tensile strength you get inside of a ligament is based on having those strands like really tightly wound and I think if they expand a bit it can it can maybe reduce the amount of load that they can bear. How about reproductive health? Reproductive health. I think if you're a female, you might have some some more concerns there. Um, 
you know, it, it, with with folostatin as far as like the follicles yeah. um, in your in your ovum, I think it's called your ovum. Yeah. I can't remember how it's called. But um, for males, I mean, I haven't been trying to yeah. to get anybody <laughs> pregnant, but um, I think. I think I felt fairly healthy there. No noticeable, like concerning stuff. Yeah. I didn't do any kind of sperm labs or anything like that. I did hear that like some people recommend uh, banking sperm beforehand, just while you're on it for the two year period. I could do that. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't have. I don't have any data on it, and I, I've not heard any um, like concerning data with any other animals as far as that goes. Um, but that is interesting. I'll look at yeah. <laughs> Having learned more about what sparked Alex's interest into biohacking, we took a trip to where he gets some of his therapies done. Yeah, so this is uh, this is kind of unfortunate. Um, here's 10th Planet Austin. There's a, quite a long trek to get to my other favorite place, which is Kuya. It's almost like 300 feet away, <laughs> uh, right over here. This is our sauna cold plunge spot. Yeah. Um, and right next door is the progenitor of all of this, which is on it, Jim. Mm. Um, and we just hit this circuit constantly, uh, going in and out of each of these buildings, and it is the greatest and, thing ever. Yeah, sure. And like, what, what's in that? What's in Kuya? Because it seems like they have like a bunch of different stuff that you can do there. Wow. So Kuya is uh, it's a one-stop shop for any biohacker. Really, we've got sauna, cold plunge, we've got floats, we've got some ketamine therapy in there, some psychotherapy, uh, a lot of contrasting uh, therapies there and uh, high quality supplements. You get some cool celebrities in there. Oh, who lives here? This is an yeah. absolutely beautiful spot. Here's Kuya. So we're coming upstairs to Kuya, um, and we're gonna show you guys some of the awesome rooms and, and environments and spaces. Mm, for, have um, you been in every room? Yes, I've yeah. been in every room up here. Uh, this is where a lot of the work gets done, a lot of the thought leadership gets done up here um, and how we're going to change the world with contrast therapies and promoting the new wave of uh, therapeutic benefits and drugs to people. Uh, so this is a, a group room. Uh, this is where we might have like a group uh, ketamine therapy setting. Wow. So your, uh, your therapist will chill in here. Can after you your... demonstrate someone doing ketamine therapy? Yeah, sure. Here you go. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I haven't actually done the therapy here. I've used ketamine in the past. Um, I'm, I'm a fairly, like, toe-deep drug user. I, I like to do them all, but I don't like to do too much. So I haven't had the, like, visionary ketamine experience yet. Um, haven't found yourself in a K-hole yet. No. We'll also do some group trainings up here, some really interesting stuff. Um, there's a lot of uh, newer, I don't know how you describe it, like... Uh, like personality tests um, and genetic, uh, like personality stuff that uh, we're experimenting with in there. This is the this is the opus bed. So this bed is actually just composed of speakers, right? What? These are all dude? speakers. Yes, and uh, you you lay down in here, and there can is you, a. Can you show me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, if one of you guys want to get down on it. Yeah, I want to get down. Yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, and each room here in Kuya is supposed to, uh, to mimic some aspect of Earth's elemental experience. So this is the space cosmos room. Okay. Um, so you would get down on the opus bed and okay. we'll select you a song of some type, which, uh, specifically corresponds to the bed. Okay. And then we dim the lights. Get real funky in here. Oh man. Oh whoa. Okay. Wild though, right? Yeah, it's so nuts. So we also have a couple other rooms that are really interesting. A lot of the themes. This is the lava room. Lava and fire room. Yes, yeah, where people come in and get some massages and stretch work. It's a very enjoyable place to get a nice massage from a shell, one of our premier masseuses here. We have the forest room. This is a nice little study for a couple people. One or two people will get some integrative work in here. And this is also like like we're like a ketamine room as well. 
Yeah, you you know this this is like a multi-purpose room. You know, you can go. I guess any room can be a ketamine room. That's right. That's if right. If you have ketamine in a room, you can work here. Um, we have the water room, another kind of like masseuse-focused uh, area. It's very nice in here. I I love this this spot. Super chill. And probably my favorite room over here is the wind room. What's this? Hey, this is this is like a massage and lymphatic drainage um, system that helps kind of move lymph around your body. Um, How does this work? Well, it just it wraps around you, and it squeezes you in a specific way with the with the right type of pressure that'll help move lymph through your body so that you're having some good drainage of that waste system. Um, and it also functions as a massage room, so. Uh, People can come in here and just relax. Nice little wind environment. Wow. And then I can take you over to our last room. I think we call this the mountain room. It's not that close. And it is. Ooh. It's very nice. It's a little bean bag vibe in here. Come and relax. Chit chat. Get your, yeah, you get your ketamine therapy here. Same couches, just like different colors. Oh, this is great. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Very lovely place. Yeah. Get some nice crystals here. Right. Can penetrate your brain with the crystal frequency or something. Yeah, yeah. Massive shout out to Kuya. Um, this place has been seriously transformative for me. Yeah. my girlfriend um why is that like 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 are you involved in all of the therapies that they you know i'm not involved in the therapies i do uh i do just have a personal relationship with the place because yeah. uh i've been here a while i also do help run the networks here um i have uh my business does a there's a contract with them so i help out with their it stuff but yeah. aside from that it's just a very very awesome place to come to, especially considering it's so close to the gym. Um, there's a lot of uh, good- Got everything you need. <laughs> yes, really good healing work here. Um, very kind hearted people that work here as well, doing good work. Yeah. So come to Kuya, check it, come, come check us out. After exploring what Kuya has to offer, I wanted to take the conversation back to Alex's interest in biohacking. What was the last interesting like hack that you had, you, you had to do? If I had to select one of the the more the more exciting exercises that I've done, uh, it has to be one that came through a mutual friend of Mac, um, and I'll redact uh, a lot of the names yeah. here. <laughs> the names, places. Um, but uh, basically, a guy I only know through a chat room, uh, and I only knew him by a handle. And uh, my mutual friend uh, Mac knew. Uh, this guy personally, I did not, but I knew the handle and both parties knew I was doing security testing and going out on my own with Glitch Digger. And so they arranged for me to do a manhunt exercise essentially in Romania. So I don't know who it is that I'm looking for. I don't know their and name. And it's just an exercise. This is this is an exercise, but it's also a, a realistic uh, exercise where you're you're actually going through all the emotions that uh, a real attacker might go through uh, in a constrained amount of time, and then you analyze that from the perspective of like, you know, a low level attacker, like a, a total noob, or your high level adversary, and you say with unlimited time, here's what a real high level guy would do, um, and that's my job is to go in there and kind of simulate all of that. Yeah. And in this case, the, uh, the story goes that a, a, a man approaches me online and says, hey, let's do this. I don't know this person's name. I don't know where they live. Uh, and the goal is to find where they live and break into their home where they have you know, specific things they want tested. Yeah. And um, this, this happened. Uh, and so I flew out to a city in Romania that I won't name, but uh, I, I showed up there with nothing other than just some tools, and I was like, "All right, let's let's find this guy." Um, and through a series of like dirty tricks and cheating, uh, I was able to discover this guy's location, 
and um, man, this I, I, I'll, I'll go into a, a part of this where so basically the first the first area of, of the um, the test is me basically finding my reins in Romania. I'm in a foreign place. They don't speak English. I'm kind of doing a lot of open source intelligence gathering through. Um, the means yeah, of like typical app, just, registries, like the European like land registry. Okay. And uh, to be honest, uh, they're a fairly um, terse, they have a fairly terse disposition in Romania. Yeah. They're not like mean people or anything, but when you interact with other folks, they don't have the same kind of openness that most Americans do, right. where there, there's, there's gotta be a reason you're speaking to me yeah. right now. Um, and that, that sense of like transactional, uh, exchange is, is just overt. Uh, so unless you have a reason to be talking to somebody, you're not really going to get a lot of information elicited from them, which is typical in America and typical of the exercise. So going around trying to ask people like, hey, where does this type of guy hang out? They're just like, what the fuck are you talking to me for? You know? Um, but that was the exercise and it was a very, very uh, fun and grueling exercise because I basically failed uh, for, a, for a long time. And not only did I fail for a long time, um, and, and the, way I, the way I'm going to categorize this failure is in a system of bounties because there's, there's different time points where it's like, hey, can you get me in a certain amount of time? You know, because the client only wants to pay for a certain bit of your hours. Right. And we were at the bare end of the bounty point. And I actually went up and used an ATM in Romania. And I won't say the bank, but it's got the bank's name on the ATM. I go up, I put my card in and I'm like, oh, I'll take off 500 bucks worth. But I see the exchange rate and I'm like 15%. I'm not paying 15%. So I don't, I don't get any money out. And I don't get any money out. And yet... The next day, my bank says I had withdrawn $500, and I knew I didn't. So I was amazed at how this happened because I checked this thing, like I fully checked for like skimmers. There's nothing there. And so I go back the next day to the ATM, and I, I inspect it deeper. And in fact, there is a proprietary, like not, not a like, like little hunky, like shitty skimmer, but like a built-in camera pointed at the pin pad. Wow. Yeah, and I was, I went into the, inside the bank and I was like, look, I don't care. I want my money back. And they started laughing with me and they were like, oh, don't worry, insurance, insurance, it's okay, you're gonna get your money. And I was like, all right, whatever. I called my bank and they were like, yeah, yeah, our insurance paid for it. So I was like, all right, I don't know how this works, but I got my money back. I'm. I'm happy, I guess, but I was kind of concerned the fact that other people might get scammed, not realizing that this is mainly a foreigner oh, yes. scam. And as I'm kind of making a stink outside of that ATM, I'm like, whatever, I leave. 30 minutes later, the target sends a photo of me standing outside the ATM to, my, to myself. So I'm now being beaten at my own game by this guy who's wow. who is toying with me. Yeah. And I am like, a, at that point, my paranoia goes deep. I'm like, how the fuck is this guy sending me a photo of myself while I'm looking for him yeah. in the midst of me having this like stressful experience of being basically hacked while yeah. I'm trying to hack this guy? Um, and that's when I kind of turned on like, I'm, I'm going into to evil mode. Like yeah. I, will, I will figure out a way to get you just for the look of my, just for the look on your face. Uh, so that's what I mean by like kind of the dirty tactics yeah. that, that came in next. What were the dirty tactics? I bugged, I bugged some radio hardware. Um, you know, when it came time to the end of the bounty, it was like, hey, we're gonna have to discuss the rules of engagement for you revealing the physical location to me. I need some assurances that this is actually your place. That this is the place it's, I'm, I'm supposed to be at. That I'm not just like inadvertently testing something that is not something I have the authority to test, right? Uh, and that's a very common thing in security engagements, just to make sure everybody's safe. Yeah. So at that meeting is when I bugged the guy. And uh, and I, I made sure to wait until the early morning where I was like, there's a decent chance he went out to party last night. Yeah. I'm gonna catch him when he's tired, you know? And uh, bam, got him at his house. Uh, and I- What did getting him look like? I found, I, well, I, you bugged him with the tracker. Right. So 
at that point, uh, you just, you're, it's very simple. You know, you're just following him back to his location, hopping his fence, jumping in his pool, um, hanging out. Uh, but I still consider it a cheat, but- um, Why is it a cheat? Because you like- Yeah, because you had to beat up with the guy first, yeah. you know? There's some other ways you can get around it um, and reverse engineer like how, how, how to find them, but in a short period of time, it's, it's quite difficult. That's so sick. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our audio editing team lead is Ashley Jimenez with support from Jessica Morales, Miley Lipton, Si Pan, Kenny Ray, Josie Yo. Matt Fernandez and Merritt Hill. Our outreach and research team lead is Desiree Nunez with support from Marissa Granados, Monica Lee, Sarah Tiersma, and Yao Luo. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.